Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Jim Steinberg. I'm the Dean here at SICE. And it's my great pleasure today to have the chance to welcome Attorney General Keith Ellison to our discussion. I'm so grateful so many of you joining us this morning. Um, Attorney General Keith Ellison was sworn in as Minnesota's 30th uh, Attorney General on January 7, 2019. And as the people's lawyer, Attorney General Ellison's job is to help Minnesotans live with dignity, safety, and respect. His guiding values are generosity and inclusion. From 2007 to 2019, Keith Ellison represented Minnesota's 5th Congressional District in the United States House of Representatives, where he championed consumer, worker, environmental, civil, and human rights protections. He served for 12 years on the House Financial Services Committee, where he helped oversee the financial services industry, the housing industry, and Wall Street, among others. Among his legislative accomplishments are passing provisions to protect credit card holders from abusive practices and protect the rights of renters and tenants. While in Congress, he founded the Congressional Antitrust Caucus and the Congressional Consumer Justice Caucus. He also served as co-chair of the Congressional Progressive Caucus, which he helped build to more than 100 members and, as you know, is such an important voice in America today. Before being elected to Congress, Attorney General Ellison served four years in the Minnesota House of Representatives. And prior to entering elective office, he spent 16 years as an attorney specializing in civil rights and defense law, including five years as the executive director of the Legal Rights Center. As the leader of this public interest law firm, he oversaw a team of attorneys focusing on delivering justice for Minnesotans who had nowhere else to turn. Attorney Jennison, thank you so much for being with us today. It really is a great pleasure to welcome you. You know, you've had an extraordinary career in public service and really a model for so many of us. One that's touched on civil rights, human rights, democracy, climate change, and immigration, all issues which are of great interest to uh, those of us who've joined uh, here today. So I look forward to the opportunity to discuss these with you and both the impact and your role here at home and the impact abroad of the work that you've been doing. Um, I want to let our audience know that we're going to be, have plenty of opportunity for questions from you to Attorney General Ellison. So if you would put your uh, questions in the Q&A, uh, we'll try to get to them and have a chance for you to hear directly from Attorney General Ellison in response to those questions. So I thought I might begin, um, you know, your career has, begun, has been defined by this powerful defense of human and civil rights, both here in the United States and Minnesota and, and abroad. And I know our, our listeners would love to hear a little bit about your own experience. How did you get to this place? How did you decide to make these choices? A young person starting out, we have so many students here. What, what, what's the path that you've trodden and how can we understand how you got to be such a powerful voice today? Well, you know, Dean Steinberg, thanks for having me. I'm really overjoyed to be here. As I was sharing with you before we started, talking to students is one of my favorite things to do. Uh, I believe we've always got to be building uh, the talents and expertise of, of, of young people and, and others. And so it's really a pleasure to be here and it's quite an honor to be at uh, your, talking with your distinguished student body. You know, we're all a product of where we come from, right? And, uh, you know, my formative years uh, were spent, you know, with my mom and dad. And my mom is uh, from uh, a rural, uh, rural uh, parish in Louisiana and her father uh, was uh, organizing black voters in the 1950s. Um, she would tell us how they boycotted him and told and said that he would not be allowed to purchase gasoline because he was stirring up a fuss and uh, causing trouble. And, um, you know, they wouldn't let, he had to put tractor fluid in his car because he couldn't get gasoline in there. He, he, uh, they had a, they had a cross, burned across from the house, of course, where they lived on Lee Street in Natchitoches. And, um, you know, of course, Robert E. Lee Street, of course. And, you know, she told many, many stories about how he was active in the civil rights movement and, you know, things like that. You know, my dad uh, was a, a psychiatrist, is one. He's 93, so he doesn't do it anymore. But he actually, uh, when he was a kid, he grew up in, a, you know, the poor neighborhoods in Detroit and used to go to the Detroit River and watch boats go by. And he loved it. And he thought it was Amazing. He said, when I get, when I get to be grown up, I'm going to get me a boat too. And he did. And so he, he applied to be a part of a, of a, of a boat club and he was denied. He ended up being the first black member 
of this of this boat club because uh, he sued him to get in. And and so, you know, th- this is the people who raised me, right? I mean, um, they uh, they had great aspiration for themselves and uh, and their society, and they didn't and they didn't take life sitting sitting down, and they and they and they fought hard to try to make it better. And uh, me and all my brothers, I'm I'm not lucky enough to have any sisters, but me and my brothers are all doing some form of service. My brother is a family care doctor in Detroit. My other brother is a is a, mini, a Baptist minister in Detroit, and my my two younger brothers are. Uh, also practicing law in, the, in where they do a lot of pro bono work and used to work in prosecutors' offices and de- in public defenders' offices. So it's just sort of a family value, you know, to to do public service. So I guess that's my best answer. You know, sometimes it's hard to know why you do what you do. It's a great story, and it's a, it's you know fascinating that that uh, he turned to the law to vindicate his rights, and obviously that may have had an impact on your. Your own, your own choice of direction. So you, you started off as a lawyer and a, and a, and a public interest lawyer, and, and then you decided to run for public office. How, what, what motivated you to take that direction? Well, you know, I was, uh, um, I was uh, married at the time, and I am now again. And uh, my wife and I, who remain very good friends, ex-wife, uh, I came home one day because I had spent the day at the legislature trying to get the legislation, legislature to do something that would, I think, be better for civil and human rights. And I even testified at a hearing. This is before I ran for any office at all. And, you know, the questions that I was asked, I did not think were were the right questions. And they all kind of pointed pointed toward, you know, war on crime, war on drugs sort of stuff. And I was there to say, if you want safety, you're not gonna get it by doing this. You're just gonna incarcerate a generation. So I got home and I kind of like, you know, usually I just take my briefcase upstairs and put it in change. This time I just sort of threw it in the corner. She heard that and she said, hey, what's wrong with you? Are you upset about something? I said, these people at the legislature, man, they're not listening. I, you know, I mean, it's just a wrongheaded policy. And she said, you know, you, they probably have a pretty hard job. And, you know, I mean, you know, do you think you could do it better? I'm like, Yes, I do. <laughs> so, so I hadn't really thought about running for office myself, but I, but I did then. I said to her, I said, you know, your living room is about to be a campaign office. You know, she said, whatever, just put your, just put your briefcase away in the night. You know, and I said, okay, fine. So anyway, um, I ran and, you know, I became a state legislator. I, I didn't really uh, have a plan to do it when I was a kid. It's not anything I dreamed about, but I did run and got in there and, uh, you know, was able to work on a lot of the issues that I really care about. And even when I ran for Congress, it really was not a plan. I did not think to myself, I want to be a congressman one day. Um, Really what happened is that we were in the middle of the Iraq war. We couldn't leave because we invested too much in lives and in in tax money. We couldn't stay because it was all premised on false understanding. And so I wanted to get into the debate to sort of make sure that the people who probably were going to win, you know, address this issue and confronted the hard truth that we needed, in my opinion, to try to get out of there. And to, um, and so that, because that was my view and I, and I mistakenly won the race. I mean, they asked me about other stuff. I mean, issues of torture were at play during that time. Um, Issues of uh, healthcare are you know perennial, right? Uh, and and so I ended up you know getting the endorsement of the Democratic Party, winning the primary, and went going to Congress in two thousand in in in, in, in seven uh, January two thousand seven. Stayed there for twelve years and loved it and was glad to serve. Uh, but the whole time I've never really thought of myself as a as a politician, even though I am one. Um, I've always kind of thought of myself as like a civil rights worker, really. Um, and you can do that no matter what job you occupy at a given time. When you're out on the hustings, um, wh- how do you, what's the most effective way to try to connect with people, to try to get your message across? What did you find to be the kind of the, the tools that were allowed you to be so successful at, in public life? Well, you know, quite honestly, it's time to task, really. You just have to sit down and listen to people, and you have to share with them their views. 
uh, but mostly it's just listening and it's hard work and there's no simple way to get around it. You know, I can tell you that one of the, I think, failings of, our, of the modern political moment is that we don't emphasize relationships nearly enough in politics. Um, sending somebody a mailer saying your opponent's a bad person does not help them understand who you are any better. Running an ad that costs a lot of money and makes a lot of folks a lot of money doesn't help people to share with you their fears and anxieties about their uh, loved one who's got cancer, right? Or their child who might be about to be deployed overseas. Uh, when I ran for Congress, it was Iraq. Now it's Ukraine. You know, but people, it, I mean, you know, parents are worried about it and it's like, what's going to happen? And is this a good idea? And is my child's life worth this conflict? You know, and these are the things that people will share with you if you give them a chance. And I think that um, one of the things that I think has helped me, me move forward in politics since is that I've always felt that the relationship is the bedrock of the political experience. And that if you give, and, and there's no quick way to do it, you just got to sit in that. You just got to go to the meeting, shut up and listen. Also, taking things seriously and not personally is key. Because a lot of times people will come talk to politicians because they're upset about something. And usually it feels like they're venting at you. But the truth is they're really not. They're coming to you because they think you're a, you might be a chance for things to get better if you're willing to just listen to them. And so you just have to do that. And sometimes people don't need you to come off with the uh, answer. They need you to listen. And that, I think, is an indispensable political tool uh, to be able to listen. And, you know, quite honestly, um, you know, I don't think people expect us to always be successful, but they expect us to be faithful to the values that we say we believe in. And so those are some things that I've tried to live by. And, uh, you know, uh, I wouldn't have it any, any other way yet. I'd rather lose an election than do otherwise. You know, I need to tell you how the problem of polarization and division has become such a powerful one in our oh, country yeah. today. And, you know, I'm just interested from your own experience working in the state legislature and then in Congress and now Attorney General, how do you bridge that divide you, to work with people, with Republicans, with people who have these different views? I mean, how, what, what, what's worked for you to try to find ways to get over this, these deep divisions? Well, you know, it, it really is one of the critical questions of our time because these divisions are, are, are dangerous. Um, I can, no matter how you feel about January 6th, and I'm one who strongly disapproves of it, um, clearly the people who did that felt overwhelming and powerful emotions, right? Why? Why? What is it that's not working right in their lives that makes them feel that that is their alternative you know and so again you got to go back to listening you got to go back to the uncomfortable place and hear people out we do have a problem with bad information nowadays but one thing that i've learned overcomes bad information is relationship relationship overcomes bad information i've seen it happen in my own political life people have said you know keith somebody told me that you're like you're a muslim and i am and that you're you know this guy from the Twin Cities, and before that, you're from Detroit. So you're an urban Black Muslim, and I'm a rural white Protestant, so, you know, Methodist, evangelical. How do you and I supposed to talk? And, and I'm telling you, I've said, look, uh, how important are all those things? They are important. But what about your son's exposure to lead? I got a bill that's going to help fix that. Talk to me about your struggles with opioids and how the, in, that impacted you. And before, and tell me about how your family is, 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 has a third generation dairy farm. You might lose it because of market concentration and the larger interest in the agricultural sector being able to just swamp, you know, and you're concerned about, you know, your child being, being deployed to Ukraine and what could happen there. And you want to know, what can the AG or what can the Congress do to make sure that your, your child's needs get met as they're worrying about deployment? It overcomes that stuff. I mean, there's, we have a pretty conservative guy. I'll even say his name. His name is Dave Baker. He's a Republican in this Minnesota state legislature. His, he lost his son to opioid um, overdose 
and he and I have worked very constructively uh, to try to get um, relief to families. Somehow, we, it's worked. He's gone to his colleagues and said, yeah, Ellison's helping us out. He's, he's been, we've been there together. And they tell him, Ellison, how can you work with that guy? Don't you know he's this, this, and this? I'm like, yeah, but he's helping us. So, and I mean, that's how you, that's, that's the only way I know. I don't know if anybody really knows. I mean, you've heard a lot of smart people say, well, it has to do with we, the way we do redistricting. There's a lot of explanations. I think it is somehow connected to um, the inequality that we see in our economy, highly polarized um, economy. We have a polarized politics, we have a polarized economy where we have, uh, you, know, uh, you know, it used to be with, if you owned a factory and you had to lay off people, it would break your heart because your family started it and you care about these people who helped build your wealth. Now it's like, uh, that's a, that's a, that's a, we got to get rid of them because it's, we can increase our profits a little more. And that, and so things have changed. I think that the economic polarization is tracking the political polarization and that, you know, if you're at the top of the economic uh, pyramid, you have the ability to influence who's in Congress, you know, who, what the tax policy is going to be. And you're like, and, you know, and, and people tend to believe that what they do is right and what they have, they deserve. So even if you have multi-billions, you don't think that you were lucky or fortunate or blessed. You think this is proof that I'm a genius and I'm going to hire some, um, um, I'm going to donate money to make sure that I can protect that in our political uh, environment. And, it, and, so it, and so it goes, right? So, you know, there's a lot of reasons, but I think the way to overcome it and to try to return to some sense of normal is relationship building. Um, and, and, you know, I, I, really, I really think that at the end of the day, that's what's going to save us. You know, when you were in Congress, you were a very powerful voice for the cause of human rights and democracy, obviously at home, but also abroad, and, and really put that as the priority on the agenda. And, and even today, we see President Biden and his administration talking a lot about human rights abuses abroad. But a lot of people abroad, you know, question this. They say, well, how can the United States make these kinds of claims when we have problems that, like the ones you know so well with George Floyd and yeah. Breonna Taylor and others? How much does that affect our ability to be effective abroad? And how, how do you answer the, the foreign critics who say, you know, clean up your own house first before you begin to uh, cast stones at us? Well, let me just say that I agree with the premise of your question. It is, it, I think that the, the, the problems that we have around human and civil rights in America weaken our credibility abroad. And I even think that they... Are a, they're a, they're a um, national security threat. Now, why would I say that? Because if, say, Vladimir Putin knows that we have racial and economic divisions and problems between police and community, why wouldn't he set up a troll farm to sort of just exacerbate those tensions and divisions to try to get Americans at each other's throats, which ultimately weakens us? Right. I mean, I think that, you know, there's a lot of evidence over the last two years that not every message, not every inflammatory message that worked people's uh, emotions came from somebody who, 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 really, who really believed in the message and sent it. There's reason to believe that people, uh, you, know, you, know, in, 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 you know, foreign interests, um, that they're the ones who sort of sent messages um, to, you know, to, to the DNC or, you know, stole information from their, uh, inf uh, from their database, shared it out in a way that would tend to divide the nation. We know that people were clicking glasses of champagne when Donald Trump won. Uh, and again, I respect the fact that you might have people of a diverse political backgrounds here, and I don't want to sound partisan, but I will say, it's not that great when you have, you know, foreign interests being that fundamentally interested in who the American president's going to be, because we, we should have some solidarity when it comes to, you know, things beyond the shore, right? And if and it, it shouldn't matter, they should, 
people abroad, I think, should say, well, you know, the American president's the American president. They're always going to stand, no matter what party it is, for human rights, for democracy, rule of law. Bam, that should be, that is our ideal. But I think we have strayed from it, and I don't think it's to our advantage at all. And I can tell you, I gave a few talks abroad about, um, you know, uh, you know, the American scene. I don't go there to inf interfere with their politics, but if they want to talk about it, there are things that we do share. And <clears throat> I'm telling you that in, in, in Portugal, uh, in Lisbon, we, the, there was a packed room to hear about George Floyd. You know, uh, you know when, I, when I was uh, in Colombia recently, I just had informal conversations with people about it. They are all very fascinated. And by the way, there are murals uh, in, in Medellin of George Floyd, right? Uh, there are, I mean, this, there's no doubt that this tragedy has had international impact. I think there were marches everywhere from Tehran to Tokyo, to Cardiff, to London, to all over the globe, or to, to Buenos Aires, all over the globe, because what, why? Do, why? People tend to care about what's going on around them. Well, people, when people see a state actor, which Derek Chauvin was wearing that uniform and everybody in the world recognizes what that uniform means, they may not speak a word of English, but they know what that uniform means because they have something similar and they saw his knee on top of George Floyd and to them you know a state actor using extra legal coercion uh, to suppress a national minority um, is not unknown to people in Canada France anywhere <laughs> and so George Floyd did become somewhat of an international symbol and it puts us in a tough position when we insist that Bolsonaro observe the rights of the indigenous people of the Amazon. It, it, it puts us in a tough position, but, it's, but not all is lost. We can change this thing. It's a matter of will, it's a matter of, and we, we can say, and, and it might even be a point of strength to say, we're not here to lecture you from some high place. We're here to tell you that we've had our own struggles with civil and human rights and we know why it's important to hold them up. And, uh, and, and so we're, we're speaking to you not as some lordly figure, but as, a, but, as other, but as citizens of this planet that we all live on. You know, and so it's, it's not all laws. It's not just a bleak story, but we gotta get about, we gotta get back to core American values. You've um, both as the first Muslim member of Congress and then also because of your connection to the, the communities in Minnesota, you've had to deal with a lot of communities in addition to the African-American communities that have had challenges in our society. Oh, yeah. Certainly tell us a little bit about that. I know the Somali community and others that, that were part of your constituency. How, how do we do a better job of, of bringing that message of our, our pluralism to our, our publics and then to the world? Well, you know, the thing is, I think that it is important to help the world understand that America's appreciation for multiracial democracy didn't didn't fall out of the sky, and actually it wasn't handed to us by Thomas Jefferson. It was won by the people who fought at Gettysburg. It was won uh, by the people who marched uh, at Selma. It was won by the women who demanded equal rights, and uh, there's an amazing story about Susan B. Anthony being charged with the crime of voting as a woman and the judge giving her a $10 fine and her telling the judge, I'm not paying your fine. And I'm even gonna go around the country giving speeches on how much I'm not gonna pay your fine. And so, you know, um, it, you know, look, I believe Jefferson gave us the inspiration, but it was Susan B. Anthony Thomas and, 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 and uh, Frederick Douglass and, and, and many others, and many others who brought us to this point in uh, between 1960, you know, between 1954, Brown versus Board, up until 1968, the, when the Fair Housing Bill was passed. In that period, I think it was that, that's when we became a multiracial democracy, really. And I think that the idea of a multiracial democracy is contested even at this very moment. But I think we need to dig in and, 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 and say, look, you know, we're, we're not saying that we just have, we're just smarter and better and higher moral plane than you. 
We're saying that we went through this thing the hard way and we've learned how damaging it is to the human spirit to not include everybody. So that's why we do it. We have an amazing story to tell. Is there any other, how many other countries in the world do you know that, you know, went through a civil war resulting in ending slavery? Now other countries ended slavery, countries in Latin America did it before the United States. Mexico did it before the United States. But the truth is we did do it and <clears throat> it was not easy. And yet we, we've, we've, we've built on this great legacy and I think it makes us more credible to talk about our familiarity with the struggles to create an inclusive society than it is just to say, you know, oh, quote, then to quote the founders in, in, uh, in beautiful language, you know, it's better to be able to say, we've had experience with this, you know? I mean, don't you feel that you're gonna listen to somebody who's went through what, you, what you're going through more so than somebody who's never gone through it? And so I think the United States, uh, uh, in, in, in new, new, new communities um, that, by the way, you know, the Somali community is all over the world. You know, you, you can meet Somalis anywhere from Kenya to Norway to London. They're, they're all those places. And yet the biggest number is in the United States because they believe here their chances for opportunity are best. Um, that's a great honor to our country. Same with so many other places. Uh, I think we just have got to continually re revisit our values and understand that it's not going to hurt anyone in America by having an inclusive society. In fact, it's going to give us access to the talents of the whole wide world and we'll be better off by it. So how do we, how do we break the log jam on immigration and refugees? I mean, here, you, as you point out, they've been such a powerful force in our society, and yet we still can't seem to come to a, a common understanding about how to, how to manage this. You know, sadly, I think that we are right now confronting the, the problem with a, an exclusionary immigration policy. Because if there's one thing that business folks tell you right now is that we have labor shortages everywhere. We have serious labor shortages. You go talk to, I mean, you know, what, what do we have? The great resigning, resignation is what they're calling it. If there's other folks who are from other places who want to fill these jobs, why wouldn't we do it, right? I mean, it just seems to me that if you are trying to open up a restaurant, but you don't have enough people, um, give, the, give these small businesses and big businesses the people they, they're looking for. And that doesn't, that doesn't mean we abandon any immigration policy. It means we have one that's more flexible than what we've been talking about over the last four or five years. I think we've got to confront the fact that a lot of working class white people feel a lot of anxiety about stat loss of status. And I don't think that we should shy from the conversation. You know, I think the real thing is if you, got a, if you, if you tell people your life would be better if we could exclude those people over there on the other side of the wall. Well, we still haven't done that much good for those folks who feel so much anxiety. You know, a few years ago, there was a, a study by a Princeton professor, two Princeton professors who found that the people whose uh, mortality or morbidity rates were not getting better were non-college whites over 50. And yet we're, we don't really talk about that population as a population that we need to have some social agency for. I mean, quite honestly, why not? I mean, look, you know, people are dying from opioids, cirrhosis, uh, and, uh, and even suicide. I just think, you know, we should think about that and, and, and try to figure out how we can, you know, have a higher quality of life for a broader number of people. Uh, in, in this country. I mean, we don't have to abandon a market-based society to do it. You know, we used to do it. I mean, you know, we used to, I mean, we passed um, fair labor standards, um, rural electrification, built highways, and provided a, you know, a social safety net for seniors and still kept a market-based economy. I mean, this idea, I mean, we can, we can do it. We, it's, we've done it. We just have to include more people. And I think it would reduce social anxiety. And I also think we need to um, 
really confront leaders who think that they're going to get into office by demonizing some other population, that we, we've got to just step up more. What we've seen some is pandering to that. And, but we've had, we've had to draw George Wallace's in the past. You know, we've had them. And, the, and history's not dealt with them kindly, right? Um, and so I think that we just need to be a little bit more, more uh, robust in our advocacy for core values. And I think we need to build relationships. And I think we need to address the fact that this economy has created tremendous gaps in opportunity, which I think are also driving political uh, strat um, uh, stratification and, and polarization. Terrific. So uh, we're going to turn to questions from the students in just a second. So I encourage you all, I know there are some already in, but if others, if you have questions, please type them into the Q&A. Let me just finish with one more, which is uh, I found really fascinating. One of the things you've taken on as um, Attorney General is the issue of climate change. And clearly, you know, there's been a lot of question about whether the federal government and Congress can, can take measures uh, to, to really do something meaningful <coughs> in the space. But meanwhile, you're moving ahead. Tell us how you're using your office uh, to address this question, how we can think about more grassroots types approaches while they still struggle with this at the national level. Well, we're, we're actually uh, doing a lot of things, but maybe the centerpiece of what we're doing is our lawsuit against ExxonMobil. We're not suing them for climate change. We're suing them for lies and deception. In 1973, we have all kinds of documentation that they knew very well that their products, their products and the use of it was causing global climate change. And we have a parallel false, uh, I mean, you know, un, un deceitful campaign where they're literally attacking people who raise the issue of climate change. As they have internal documents saying, yes, this is climate change, we're causing it, we know that we're burning fossil fuels is that it's part of it. They're simultaneously calling people who are calling attention to it chicken littles. Uh, and and they have a whole, you know, and they have a whole campaign. And, we lay out that campaign and it's extensive. And we're like, this is a false, you, this is false advertising. This is a unfair and deceptive uh, advertising, what we call a UDAP campaign, uh, UDAP action. And so we're suing them for that. We're, our lawsuit is moving forward with progress. There have been other lawsuits that have not been as successful. We believe we got them on this. Our theory is not too different from the tobacco one. You are advertising that four out of five doctors smoke pell-mell. Well, that's implying that, that, that people who know health and medicine approve of smoking. That's not true. That's a lie. And, and so we sued them on this false advertising theory. We think we're going to win again. And so we're, we're, we're making a lot of progress, but we're not just staying, we're not just leaving it up to the lawyers. And it's a good idea to never leave everything just up to the lawyers or up to the legislators. We need citizen action. So we're doing a lot of public conversation about what we're doing. We're bringing in farmers. We're bringing in indigenous community who was, are telling us about, you know, how their cultivation of wild rice is a problem. And small farmers who are saying we never used to have water in the, you know, now we, we have rotting crops in the, um, uh, in the, uh, in the field. We, we have climate chaos right now. And, and so we're bringing in community to really discuss this and raise, raise those concerns. Uh, and, and of course, you know, you know we, we, we're, we're working with other states. And I would just say this, if, if you're thinking about how to make an important difference in our, in our country, never, never forget about the state AGs. 43 out of the 50 AGs are elected by the people. Another five, my, one, one of them is appointed by the legislature. That's what they do in Maine. And others are appointed by the governor, but after they're elected, they can only be fired for cause. And so we engage in multi-state litigation all the time on multiple fronts. Facebook, Purdue Pharma, Big Pharma, all kinds of stuff. We do it all the time. And so we have been able to move the ball and we can move quicker than the federal government does. And oftentimes, the federal government will partner with us after we've already initiated some things. And so I would say that, um, that, that this is a, that, that on the issue of climate, but sit down with your state AG and sit down with your, your, your AG is Carl Racine. He's a tremendous leader and he's open, open door. And everybody knows that you never know when the next great idea is gonna come from. 
And so if it's something that I'm sure that in DC, uh, AG General Racine would be more than happy to, to, to hear the views of the students of John Hopkins uh, School of Advanced International Studies. Excellent. So let, let's hear from the students, uh, of size. Um, uh, my colleague, uh, Chris Crosby, is going to join us. He's, he's been monitoring the questions and he's going to share them with us. Thank you, Attorney General. Hey, Chris. Uh, we've had a few questions come in uh, related to, to your faith and, and the, the uh, way in which it's informed uh, all, many aspects of your life. So I'm going to pick out a few and, 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 and raise them. So Mag did ask, um, how does your faith inform your, your policy priorities, uh, such as social economic justice and human rights? Um, how do we truly get to a human rights focused foreign policy? Well, you know, um, I, my, I'm, a, I'm a person who goes to the, to the mosque on Friday and I fast during Ramadan and I've been to Hajj and I look forward to going back. Um, but I still don't really believe that it's right for me to try to push my faith on other people. But my faith does inform my values. But my faith informs my values the way that any person of any faith's values could be informed. Um, uh, I, I believe that it's critical to be honest and truthful, that we have a duty to the poor, that we have an ops, a, a responsibility to be charitable and just, and that I believe that there's enough. There's enough water, there's enough food, there's enough health care. And that so often when we see shortages and we see poverty, they're, they're a matter of political and cultural choice rather than just not enough. And so those are some things that inform my faith. Um, and uh, truth be told, I've learned over the years that I have those these same values I share with people of, of uh, Christianity, Judaism, Hinduism, and Buddhism. And there's some Muslims who don't share those values. But honestly, I don't know if LCC and MBS share those values. I think that's a fair question. They're Muslim, just like me. But, uh, you, know, you know, but I'm sure there's a lot of Christians who uh, other Christians are not bragging about, right? So my point is people, of, people who believe in honesty, charity, people who believe in fairness, inclusion you know we need to form our we need to form we need to come together right and figure out where we go from from here um let me say this also about about my about my faith you know um it is important to understand that when i became a member of congress in 2006 the world it's remarkable how things have changed right I have a, I, just, I was just reading how Roy Moore, a former judge in Alabama, wrote a long letter about how I should not be allowed into Congress because I was a Muslim and how it should be illegal for me to use Quran to swear in as I did in my ceremonial, not official swearing in. There is no book in your official swearing in. And when you do your picture, you know, you can have whatever you want. Uh, uh, and, and, and then, you know, uh, Virgil Good said that I should not be allowed, said, he said, he wrote a letter to all his constituents that unless we supported the Virgil Good immigration bill, many more Muslims would be coming to Congress insisting on being sworn in on the Quran. Nobody told him I was born in Detroit, but I guess facts don't always matter for some people. So my, my point is, that nobody's doing that today. And in some ways, you have members of Congress who are, is, who are as if not more extreme than there were in, in 2006. In 2006, they didn't storm the Capitol, right? But so the level of intensity probably is greater, but the level of anti-Muslim hate for one reason or another has just receded. And it's strange, I mean, you. I would, you know, there's a book I, that this anti-Muslim uh, author wrote called The Muslim Mafia. I'm like, what was all the fuss about? Turns out that the Muslim community is not a fifth column. Turns out that none of this, that none of us were trying to promote, um, you know, Sharia law or any of that nonsense. I mean, by the way, I do engage in Sharia law every day when I, when I don't eat pork, that's Sharia. When I, 
when I pray five times a day, that's Sharia. When I, I mean, when I go to the mosque on Friday, that's Sharia. So, <laughs> you know, when people say, are you practicing Sharia? I'm like, oh, kind of I am. <laughs> but, but um, you know, their idea is cutting off somebody's hand or some other thing, which of course is ridiculous. But, you know, things have really changed. But, but my core faith, uh, it does, it, it keeps me up. It gives me hope. It keeps me going. And I respect folks who don't, you know, adhere to any faith. And I was totally, and I, I, I respect folks who reject faith, but for me, it works. And uh, I think I'm going to stick with it. Excellent. Building on that, uh, our colleague, uh, Rebecca, um, says, as a Muslim American, I still remember that you took the oath of office on the copy of the Quran owned by J Thomas Jefferson. That act, while a proud moment for me, was met with a lot of criticism, especially from more conservative factions of our country. In your opinion, as someone who has been in public service for some time, <clears throat> how flexible and tolerant are the U.S. political systems? Will our systems, as they stand, be able to meet the increasingly multicultural society we are creating? What aspects in your opinion, are most vulnerable? Well, let me tell you, um, representative democracy is a fragile system. And there's nothing, nothing written in the stars or anywhere else that it will always be here for us. I'm not sure who said this. Maybe I bet you the dean might know, but I don't know. Somebody said that the price of freedom is eternal vigilance. And Maybe, I don't know who it, maybe, was that, was that Benjamin Franklin or somebody? I don't know. Somebody help us, put it in the chat if you figure it out. But it is true though, right? Our systems are good and our systems sort of held up when people were saying, I mean, people violently tried to attack the Capitol for the purpose of stopping a sort of properly certified election. That, to me, that is earth shattering. And stunning when you fact when you just think about it a little bit now our systems held even in georgia republican state they said no we actually we conducted a fair election here you had the president of the united states saying i just need x number more votes they didn't break they didn't buckle but why was it because the system or because individuals had a greater love and loyalty to the core values of this nation than they did, than they were afraid of the president, right? I mean, I know I'm getting into sort of partisan sounding waters here, but what happened actually happened and I we can't sugarcoat it. It did, I would be as outraged if it was a Democrat that did this. But I'm saying that those folks who ran that system of, of election in Arizona or in, uh, or in uh, Georgia, they, they hung in there. And that is, that is, that's a wonderful thing. They should be commended for just not breaking. Mike Pence deserves great credit. They're threatening to kill him. And yet he said, mm, I'm not doing that. And by the way, he had people writing legal memoranda to see if he could. And he came to the conclusion that he could not. And just the other day, he said, uh, the president was wrong. To ask, to ask him not to certify the election results. So I would say that it's not necessarily our system, although it does, although there is credit to be given to the system. I think fundamentally it's about people who just have a love of this country and democracy in their hearts. And they know, hey, maybe we lost this election, but we're gonna get up and try to win it the right way next time. And so that I think is what really saved us last time. And the question, and I guess we're going to have, I'm hearing that we're going to have another election in, uh, in a little while. And you just pray and hope that those same people or some other new people have the same level of fidelity to the values of the country. But Sorry, it is some I, common, I, yeah. Mm -hmm. ahead, please. I was just going to say, but it is some combination of the system and the people. And I'm not sure. I'm sorry, Dean. No, no, so I, I, I can't help but pick up on your, your passing reference to MBS when we were talking about the influence of faith. And 
and and courtesy of our School of International Affairs. And I'd love to get your yeah. thoughts on what do we do about a situation like that? You know, this indisputably in, in many different ways, from killing journalists to uh, to the treatment of women at home and 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 uh, people of different. Shafts in, in the Shia. Shia. exactly. Um, so how, do, how does the United States navigate this? Important partner, major source of energy. What, you've had a lot of dealings with this in your, your time in Congress. What, what do we do to, to try to deal? Do we just cut them off? Do we turn our back? How do you, how do you have an impact not on the, the guys you don't like who are causing human rights violations, but people who are your, your strategic partners? Let me tell you, it, I, let me acknowledge the difficulty of the problem. Because even if we do just say, you know what? we're not working with you after what you did, um, he'll be, you know, he, he will very, you know, he'll say fine with us. <clears throat> China, how many barrels you need? Russia, how many? Well, barrel, I guess Russia has its own oil, but there are, there, there, there's, a, there's a market out there. But what I think we should do is understand that Saudi Arabia is gonna have a leader. It doesn't have to be this one. And I think we should create an environment where the Saudi, um, you know, royal, royal family, if that's the system they're going to stick with, understands that their head of state is a liability. And, you know, we, and I think we should creatively look for ways to tell them, you know, you can have whoever you want to run your country, but this is a problem. And it's, in, you know, and this is inhibiting, you know, because I mean, think about it. MDS makes us look like hypocrites. It's in our national, national interest to, to, to be very clear that this is not all right. And, and so uh, a cold cutoff, I think there are costs to be paid for that. Uh, and, there are, and there's political damage to be suffered for that but a very clear strategy uh, of, of isolation, of, of disapproval, building allies to that effect, I think is important. Because quite honestly, there are more leaders like MBS than there are like Joe Biden. Um, there's, you know, and it seems like they're, and it seems like they're, they're more in vogue than, than than the democratic leaders are now. We've got to change the international tide away from this drift toward authoritarianism. It's a bad thing. The world will regret it. In 20 years, we're going to look back and say, how do we let this happen? And we need to look back to historic precedents to say, how do you add pressure and disapproval? I mean, like there's, you know, so like, I mean, I, th I think sanctions, I mean, certainly we shouldn't be selling them more, more weapons. I do agree with the folks in Congress who say, you know what, we're not going to sell them any more weapons. And we should go to allies and say, well, and neither are you. I mean, as I know this is all easier said than done, but once somebody can just go, go murder a journalist in a foreign country, that's a, that's a step beyond. Can't, and I, and I, and I, I would be one who would be in favor of of, of, of a calculated, multifaceted response demonstrating disapproval, understanding full well that it's complicated, but, um, but we just, it's just not something that we can, it is in the long-term uh, disinterest of the United States. Because as we started out the conversation with Dean Steinberg, part of what makes the United States the United States, part of what makes it a country that is admired and respected is that we do believe in the rule of law. So MBS is hurting our brand <laughs> by his action. And so I think that we should understand, I mean, what he did, I mean, is, is just like, you know, it, it, it undermine, it, I mean, it undermines us. I mean, if, if George Floyd undermines us, so does MBS, murder of Khashoggi. It, both of them allow a Bolsonaro to say, y'all don't really mean it. And so, uh, again, I know I'm proposing something that is easier said than done. Um, I don't think we, I don't know if a simple chop off is, is possible, but I do know 
intense diplomatic um, engagement around the issue, coupled with um, suspending or cutting off arms sales, coupled with some well-placed speeches by our head of state um, might cause the royal family to say, you know, you're not the one, dude. You're not, you're not the right face we need. I mean, look, the, 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 the Saudi royals are pragmatic, <laughs> you know. They, they are very pragmatic, and I think that they need to know, you know, that can't, we can, this is not something that's going to work out. Even MBS himself might be able to have a life after if we took a very tough stand, but he just couldn't be the head of state. You know, um, that, that might be, but, 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 the, but having him do what he did and we act like it didn't happen, um, it, it undermines a core, a, a core piece of what the United States is all about and is known to be all about. So staying in the same region and also in terms of the U.S. brand, two of the greatest humanitarian catastrophes that are taking place right now are Yemen and, and Syria. I mean, right. what, what responsibility do we have and what should we be doing in, in both of these cases? Right. Well, I took a position that I'm sure some of your students may or may not agree with. I happen to have visited Syria before uh, the Arab Spring, and I have a lot of friends in the United States from Syria. They're not Syrians because they didn't like living in Syria. They're Syrians because the Assad family chased them out of the country and they were worried about threats of death. And uh, they, will, they will tell you stories about Hamas uh, of many years ago and they'll tell you stories about relatives that they have been tortured and murdered and disappeared now. And so I took the position that the United States should work with Turkey to say, you can't fly in this part of the country and we're gonna create a safe zone. Now, a lot of my friends who are pacifists said, how dare you stand for military action? And I, and I, but I came to the conclusion that, look, you know, um, th this is a very serious problem that we, you know, you're talking about the dissolution of, of, this, of a state, mad chaos rampant human rights abuses, we should do something. And if we do, um, you know, uh, we might, who knows, but what we, but after, but I think, I think that after he was using uh, those, those chemical bombs on, on his own population, understanding the easy transportability of those sort of weapons, I thought that, um, stronger action should have been taken. Now, I don't blame Obama because I was there in Congress. There was absolutely no appetite for it. And if you remember, um, the British Parliament took action before and said no. And, you know, I mean, that's the problem with, with things like Iraq. Whenever you do need to take action, now you can't because everybody has is dealing with the ghosts of a bad action, right? And that's why we've got to always be very careful about the use of military force. And so, I mean, what I'm, again, you know, the, your, 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 your school, the SICE program is dedicated to solving some of the toughest problems facing all humanity. And so that's why you got to go to school to understand it because it's not just intuitive. But I think that, um, Yemen, on the other hand, I think that is an immorally legal war. It just needs to stop. I think it's driven a lot by Saudi paranoia of Iran. I was one who supported the, the uh, Iran deal and thought that it was a good thing for the region. Um, you know, uh, Iran does not have the wherewithal to sustain a war against anybody, including our ally uh, in the region. But so there's such effort to get a nuclear weapon essentially is to stop people from invading them, uh, a defensive posture. If we could persuade them to suspend enrichment and things like that, um, that was, I think, the smart thing to do. Unfortunately, I was there and voted against having it dismantled, and I think it set the region back, personally. So 
I would have done a no-fly zone in 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 uh, in Syria. Uh, I would not have supported the Saudi war in Yemen, uh, and uh, I would have. Uh, and I thought the the uh, Obama effort um, at, a, at a peace deal with at a peace, you know the you know the what the the Q four is it the Q five plus one or the Q four plus one? I actually forgot, but I thought it was a very important diplomatic effort, and it was meaningful and important and I was sad when it got torn apart and I think the region would be better off today if those things if those three things that I recommend would would be in place. So we're, we're just about out of time but I always like to give you a, a last chance for for some advice and counsel to our students out there what what, what what words should they take away from your own career and your own experience? Well let me just state the obvious we live in one world man I mean H1N1 didn't care about boundaries. Ebola didn't care about boundaries. And COVID sure doesn't care about boundaries. We are a united pole in this world. We've got a, we've got a, I believe in multilateral engagement. I, I absolutely believe that it is, is, is one of the most important things. I believe that diplomacy is extremely important. It is the tool of the strong. It is always better to talk it out than to shoot it out. I believe our country uh, is suffering ill effects because of our exclusionary uh, immigration policy. We should open it up and include people. It should be orderly, of course, but it should. But but saying that nobody can come here is ridiculous, and it is hurting our country as we do that. And I would just say that if there's one field, one profession that has the promise of stabilizing this world, it is people who are studying international diplomacy. So please, you know, devote yourself, yourself to your studies and get out there and make friends for America and help us stabilize this planet, whether it's international global health, arms issues, national security, international security, it, all these problems await you and you can help fix them. So. That's all I got for you today, Dean Steinberg. That's music to my ears, and I hope I hope they're listening, and I hope they're proud of what they chose to do by coming here, because that's what we're all about. So thank you so much. This has been fascinating, and really appreciate you sharing your own experiences and your perspective on these things. I know on behalf of everybody out there who's listening, we all want to thank you for, for taking the time. Absolutely. Let's do it again sometime. Excellent. Take care. Right. Thank you very much. That